I spent some of our savings on my own hobbies, and my husband accused me of financial infidelity despite his luxury hobbies, such as golf. Me, 33 female, and my husband, 33 male, have been married for 10 years, together since college. Since starting out we have made financial security a priority and have been able to achieve that, albeit with some good luck along the way. We both have good jobs, paying close to 200k each. Student loans were paid off within a few years, both went to state schools with some scholarships so didn't have a lot of debt to begin with, we live in a house I inherited from my grandmother, no mortgage, and don't have any credit card debt. We max out our 401, KEs and currently have 18 months of expenses in our emergency fund and are still adding to it. Our cars are both paid off and should be good for another 5 plus years and we don't have any credit card debt. We manage our finances in a hybrid manner, joint accounts for bills and savings, and separate accounts for our fund money, we each get a pretty generous monthly allotment. The fund money is strictly for our individual expenses, hobbies, clothes, outings with friends, etc. And not for things like date nights, vacations, or larger joint purchases like household appliances and repairs which come out of our joint account. We also agreed that if either of us gets any bonuses, or has any side hustle income, those will go into our individual fund money accounts, unless the funds are needed for a larger expense such as a major home repair. In terms of the fund money, my husband is much more of a spender than I am due to expensive hobbies. In particular golf and collecting sports memorabilia, and he's also more into designer clothes, which is fine, it's his fun money. On the other hand, my hobbies are a lot less expensive, running, working out, reading, baking. In general I'm more introverted and a great time for me is tea with a friend at one of our homes, with homemade pastries. I have also been getting back into gaming lately after setting it aside for much of the past decade while building my career. After realizing I had more than enough in my fun money account, I decided to overhaul my gaming setup and got myself a new PC, desk and gaming chair, total cost of about $5,000. However, upon hearing about the purchase, my husband is furious. He says he had no idea I had saved so much money and that I should have consulted him before spending $5k. I asked what difference it made if it was my own accrued fund money and not our joint funds, and he insisted that my accumulating this amount, without telling him, was a form of financial infidelity. He says he lost trust in me and doesn't know what else I might be hiding. He is demanding that I return the items I purchased and deposit most of the funds to our joint account. He wants to make a new rule that fund money accounts can't accumulate more than $2K and that any excess goes back to the joint account, a rule that would obviously favor him as a person who spends most of his allotment each month instead of saving up for anything bigger. I feel like I am being punished for being more of a day-to-day -day saver than spender. It wouldn't occur to me to demand to know how much my husband has in his fun money account or to try to micromanage what he spends it on. I wasn't hiding anything deliberately. He never asked about it until after I made the purchases. Still, maybe I should have been more transparent about my plans. So am I the arsehole. Miscellaneous info, husband and I each have our own office, hobby room in the house so it's not like the gaming setup was going in a space he uses. I don't usually game when my husband is home unless he's already busy doing something else. My biggest block of gaming time is typically when he's off playing golf. Also, I run 40, 50 miles a week so it's not like I'm generally sedentary. I can't think of a good reason why he would object to me gaming or having a nice gaming setup in my own space in the house. Comments and OP's replies. A commenter asked OP, Girl, what does he actually contribute to your household? OP then replied, Perhaps because I'm home all the time, having a very tidy home and fresh cooked meals is a priority for me. I primarily do those things for me and not for him even though he benefits as well. I'd still have to cook and clean if I were living in the house by myself, unless I wanted to hire someone to do those things, but I don't as I genuinely enjoy cooking and housework. We do have breakfast together most days unless he has to leave early, dinner together most days, and weekend date or activity time in addition to pursuing our own hobbies. He's smart, hilarious and a delightful companion, at least other than this latest issue. I realize I haven't emphasized the positive in this thread, because I've been pretty pissed huh, but other than this he has been a great partner and husband. People are confused on how much money they have, so OP elaborates, together we have joint cash savings of 250k, plus retirement savings approaching the 7 figure mark. When asked, could he be hiding a debt gambling addiction? OP replied, I manage all our bank accounts and check them daily and also handle all the bill pay. Nothing suspicious so far. He admits he's not great with money and would spend more without a budget. Update 1, 8 days later. My husband finally calmed down enough to have a conversation with me. As many others who provided comments suggested, it wasn't really about the money, 
but a window into larger issues in our relationship. Essentially, my husband has been feeling increasingly unhappy with me for a while, for the following reasons. In general, he feels that he's a lot more committed to his career development than I am to mine. It's true that although we currently have about the same income, the ceiling for his field, finance, is a lot higher than the one for mine, tech, software dev. He's currently in an executive training program and I'm decidedly not. He's feeling resentful that he's having to work long hours in a high-pressure environment, while I get to work primarily at home doing something that is fun and fairly easy for me and I'm not stretching myself to do more. He's concerned that over time these resentments are going to build, and that I'm not going to end up pulling my weight financially if he takes huge leaps in his career and I don't. He remarked that, since getting back into gaming a few months ago, I have been putting a bit less effort into cooking. I do nearly all the cooking because I work at home and have an easier schedule. It's true that I have been fixing simpler meals, things like grilled chicken salads, or chili with cornbread, instead of elaborate meals with fussier foods and several sides. He has also noticed that I haven't been doing the elaborate table settings I used to, with flowers on the table, fancy placemats, etc. Honestly, I didn't realize he noticed or cared about this, but apparently he does. Acts of service are one of his main love languages so overall he's feeling a little neglected because of this. He also feels I'm not putting enough effort into my appearance. Not in terms of weight body, I'm a long distance runner and slim, but in terms of things like clothes, hair, etc. It's true that I've never paid much attention to these things, given that I work at home in tech the standard for appearances is extremely low and I far exceed that. I tend to buy simple, practical clothes at places like Target and Walmart, don't wear much makeup and keep my hair in a simple ponytail. I do glam up a lot more for date nights and other dressy occasions, but most days he comes home from work to find me in a t-shirt and yoga pants with no makeup, and he wants me to make more of an effort. The bottom line is that because of all these things, he's starting to notice other women. Says he hasn't cheated, he's just noticing other people because he's regularly disappointed in me. In particular, given that he works in finance there are a good number of very career-oriented, type A women who manage to have fantastic bodies, be effortlessly polished and glam, and have more interesting hobbies. He also says he feels horrible about all this because he knows I'm a good person and that he's being judgmental. That it's not so much I've changed as that his own goals and expectations have changed in the past couple years. The financial infidelity part came into it because he feels I'm not really investing in myself and our relationship, thus cheating on our future in a sense. He also says he loves me enough to be honest, I do believe he isn't trying to be hurtful. I really had to drag all this out of him. That he doesn't want us to drift apart further, that he doesn't want to be angry and resentful and he knows he is asking for a lot. I know that many on this sub might say I should just tell him to take a hike and call my lawyer, but we've been married for 10 years, have invested a lot in the relationship and I want to see if the marriage can be saved. So a couple things. First, we made an appointment with a marriage counselor and started next week. Also, I'm going to try to do at least some of the above. I'm not sure about making myself be more professionally ambitious when I'm already happy with my work-life balance and we're already financially very comfortable, but I can at least try doing the other things, return to spending more time on cooking and decor, and fix myself up a bit when he's on his way home from work, now that I know they are important to him. I also know that in the end, I may feel like I am just tiptoeing around and contorting myself to please him, but it won't cost me much. Certainly much less than a divorce, to try for a month or two and then see how we both feel. And I know I would always regret it if I didn't try. So maybe not the update that you were expecting or hoping for, but that's where things are. And if folks continue to be interested, I can update further once we have started marriage counseling and once I can feel out how the changes are going. I need to call it a night but once again thank you to everyone for your responses. They were really eye-opening and helped me to see that I do deserve better than the way I am being treated and that the expectations my husband is laying out for me are unfair and unrealistic especially as he isn't doing anything at all to make it easier for me to meet them or to show me he appreciates my efforts and everything I do bring to the table. I am indeed conditioned to be very people-pleasing and that is impacting what I think is reasonable here. I have a lot to think about, such as, what do I asterisk really asterisk want here? What is going to make me happy, especially if I have to keep making myself smaller, metaphorically speaking, and contorting myself to please my husband? Do I really want to be in a marriage under those conditions? I think I'm really selling myself short if I just agree to most of what he demands. Still going to go to the marriage counseling appointment but I think I will wait to make any other changes until we can at least get some professional input. Many of OP's comments, before her edit, are her explaining why she will do what her husband has requested. Here is an example. Thanks. The things I am willing to do at the moment won't take very much in terms of time, 
and if they genuinely make him feel more appreciated and cared for they will absolutely be worth it. I want to show my husband that I am hearing him and taking his concerns and feelings seriously enough to at least asterisk try asterisk, to make an effort in what he asked. If it doesn't work it doesn't and we can still separate a couple or few months down the road, but I would definitely regret not even trying. Update 2. So the more I thought about it, the more his requests, demands really, were sitting poorly with me. I decided to try a little experiment over the weekend to see what would happen if I tried to meet some of his demands. Not because I actually thought they were reasonable, but because I increasingly had the sense that the goalposts would just keep moving and that I was playing a losing game. So, Saturday morning, I went to the salon for a glow-up, haircut, fresh highlights, mani, petty, then went to the farmer's market to pick up fresh flowers for our table and assorted other gourmet ingredients. Saturday is usually our date night out but I suggested we stay in so I could make us a special dinner, steakhouse style, lobster bisque, bread basket with several types of rolls, savory muffins made from scratch, crab stuffed mushrooms, filet mignon, au gratin potatoes, white chocolate mousse topped with raspberries. I wore a lavender, his favorite color on me, sheath dress and high heels and fully done hair and makeup. For all that I got a lukewarm thanks, it was tasty, and a kiss on the cheek. Of course I did all the serving and clean up. Sunday we usually go out but he suggested I make us brunch at home. So I made French press coffee, mimosas with fresh squeezed orange juice, Belgian waffles with a bananas foster topping, eggs scrambled with parmesan and fresh herbs from our garden, roasted fingerling potatoes, and maple glazed bacon. I wore a blue sleeveless sundress, wedge sandals, again did my hair and makeup, Again I got a thanks, it's good, and no help with serving or cleanup. Afterwards I asked if this is what he had in mind when he critiqued me before. He said that it was a start, but that I was acting very entitled for wanting credit for basic adulting. He then dropped a bomb that he was being so hard on me because he had realized lately I had a lot to make up for due to my being a low-value woman. I asked what on earth he meant by that and he said it was because I wasn't a virgin when we met. What? Keep in mind we started dating at 21, Neither of us claimed to be virgins or stated that as an expectation. Except for very religious people, neither of us is, I don't think most 21-year-old college students are virgins. I was upfront with him then that I'd had two previous partners, my high school boyfriend, we went our separate ways when we went to different colleges in different parts of the country, and another boyfriend I'd had my first year of college. And that's it, both committed relationships and nothing casual. He then went on to say that because of my low value, I was going to need to be making it up to him for the rest of my life. That I didn't deserve monogamy or equal treatment and that I was lucky that anyone at all wanted to marry me. And that he's connected with someone from work so if I wanted to keep him I'd better step up. I told him it didn't sound like there was anything to keep if he no longer loved me, or even liked or respected me. Told him to leave and he said he would gladly go to his girlfriend's place. I know so many people here insisted he was having an affair and I just didn't want to see it that his complaints were really all part of a campaign to distance himself from me. I feel so foolish for just thinking he was going through a stressful time at work or that he genuinely wanted to work on our marriage. Anyway, I have taken the week off from work to get my head together. Have an appointment with a lawyer tomorrow. Cancelled the marriage counseling appointment but got a referral to an individual therapist who can do an intake session with me later in the week. He, and the girlfriend apparently, are coming this evening to get more of his clothes and things so I have to brace myself for that. Also, please be assured I do not think I'm low value in any way. I let my husband make me think less of myself on some levels for a short time but now I truly see it was a him problem. Obviously we don't share the same goals and values and he has become someone I don't recognize. I know the divorce won't be fun or easy, but I will be okay. Thank you all for helping me see that I was being played before I wasted too much more time in a marriage that was already over. Comments and OP's replies. A commenter said, a spouse who is having an affair starts criticizing aspects of the betrayed spouse's appearance, taste, upbringing, values, and background that were never an issue before he or she chose to stray as, in their warped perception, justification for cheating. I will bet you dollars to half moons, a bakery treat from my childhood home, that OOP's non-virginity was not a true problem for her STBX or he never would have married her. He simply latched onto it as rationalization for his outrageous demands, a deflection from his infidelity, because it's something that she cannot change. I would say that he is the low-value partner. OP replied, yes, this completely makes sense now. Initially he started criticizing things that had never been an issue before, but that would hurt my feelings, but ultimately they were things I could change if I wanted to. My appearance, cooking housekeeping effort, and even my career aspirations. When he found I asterisk did asterisk making a quick effort to change some of those things, appearance, cooking and housekeeping, 
he moved to criticizing something I cannot ever change, my sexual history, something he could hold over me forever if I stayed in the relationship. It's very clear now and scary how he was able to erode my self-esteem and confidence to the point that I actually believed a lot of his BS until he took it too far. Update 3. Hi all, I wasn't going to post another update, at least not this soon, but have gotten dozens of DM slash messages asking if I'm okay and how things are going, so this is specifically in response to those who were checking in on me. Folks have been asking me this week how things went with him picking up his stuff, meeting with my lawyer, etc. So wanted to share those updates for anyone interested. So he was supposed to come get his stuff on Tuesday evening, a couple days ago, but told me at the last minute he couldn't because Amy, his girlfriend, wasn't feeling well. Some people called in the comments, but yes, she's pregnant apparently. He told me this on text so I have proof of the affair in writing now, it's not just his word against mine. Anyway, I didn't want him to keep jerking me around on the schedule, for whatever reason, so I told him I'd pack his stuff for him and arrange for movers. I think it's better that way. I really didn't want him them in the house. I already had arranged for a friend to come over on Tuesday when he and Amy were supposed to come by so the two of us spent the evening packing his clothes and other personal effects. The movers came yesterday and got the boxes and the furniture items he wanted. He didn't want much, just the stuff from his home office and his dresser, as apparently Amy's apartment is small. I provided a detailed inventory and photos of everything, which he approved, so he can't say that I broke or otherwise ruined his stuff. After that yesterday I went to the clinic to get STD tests, won't have the results for a week or so but thankfully I haven't had any symptoms, and met with my lawyer, who said I had a good case for grounds of adultery and mental cruelty if I want need to go that route, at a minimum it's leverage to get him to settle quickly and quietly. Also lock down all the finances within the parameters provided by the lawyer so that he can't empty our joint funds or take anything that belongs to me, changed account beneficiaries and all that fun stuff. Changed the locks to the house too. I decided to take the advice of some of the commenters and am getting rid of the bed and other bedroom furniture I shared with him. I'm donating it, someone is coming this afternoon to haul it all off, and am going to completely redecorate the bedroom to my own taste, that will take a bit, staying in one of the guest rooms in the meantime. I'm also taking a spa weekend away, leaving tomorrow morning and back Sunday night, just to get a change of scenery before I have to go back to work next week. And yes, even after buying the gaming setup, I have plenty of fun money left in my account to afford my lawyer's retainer and redoing the bedroom as well as my getaway, with plenty left over. Here's to frugality when it counts. Those are the main updates for the moment. I'm doing better than expected I think, and realizing more day by day that it really wasn't a good marriage, at least not for the last couple years when he started expecting me to do everything around the house, and all the other emotional labor of running our lives outside of work, with no help and little to no gratitude. Amy sure is going to have her hands full. Comments and OP's replies. The incoming child. Also, he was hardcore child-free before. I didn't want kids either, but he was especially militant about it. I mean, maybe he changed his mind, but it doesn't seem like this was exactly a planned pregnancy. Plus, he can't even be bothered to put his own laundry in the hamper or put a dish in the dishwasher. How is he going to deal with an infant? Anyway, not really my problem and I guess he'll figure it out. Or not. Is he her superior at work? My understanding is that they are peers, he isn't her boss. I don't think it is against the rules for co-workers of the same level to date. At least not as some of our, well, his really, friends met at work there and it wasn't an issue. So for that reason I think I'll stay out of it, especially as I do want him to stay gainfully employed until the divorce is completely final. Still, I agree it's awfully foolish to have an affair at work that results in a pregnancy while one of the people is still married. I mean, you can't hide that messiness, it's going to be physically obvious. Further info on that? Right, it's probably going to cause some drama at the office but isn't fireable unless they do something even more foolish like getting caught in the act at work. As far as I know nothing like that happened, when he was disclosing the affair the other day he said that he often went to her place after work when he was supposedly working late, and sometimes on Saturdays instead of playing golf. How is a 24-year-old making the same amount of money as your ex? They are both in an executive training program for fairly recent MBA graduates. Amy is apparently some sort of prodigy who got hers at 21. My STBX started out in supply chain management, then the company paid for his MBA which he finished a couple years ago and after that, he moved to the finance side and was accepted into the training program earlier this year. She's 24, apparently graduated from college at 18 and got her MBA at 21. And he just got his MBA a couple years ago, and was on a different business operations track before switching to finance. Once again, I cannot thank everyone here enough. 
I need to get ready for my spa weekend away. So apologies if I have not responded to your comment or DM, but I am really grateful for all the support and encouragement. Hopefully there won't be any more notable updates for a while. I really just want a smooth and easy divorce and to get on with my life. So please keep your fingers crossed for me. Update 4. I'm updating again here because a lot of kind people have been checking in with well wishes and to see how I'm holding up. Sorry for not updating sooner, but as soon as I got back from the spa weekend I mentioned in my last update, I dove into working with my attorney on the divorce settlement, and didn't think it wise to put my business on the internet, however anonymously, with the legal issues up in the air. The good news is that we were able to come to an agreement pretty quickly and everything is now executed, just waiting for the court date which could take another couple months, but my lawyer says the agreement is airtight. It wasn't quite as favorable as most of you all lovely folks probably would have wanted for me, but I was highly motivated to get it done fast. I did get everything that really mattered to me. First, the house I inherited from my grandmother is 100% mine, along with all the furnishings and other effects in the house. My own retirement accounts and my fun money account are all mine as well. Otherwise, I did have to give him 75% of the other cash assets. Although he wasn't on the title for the house, he did contribute substantially to the large renovation we did, as well as to upkeep since then, and the house appreciated very substantially in the years since we moved in. It's fine as I still have plenty of money, especially as I'm quite frugal most of the time and can rebuild cash savings quickly. Our agreement also states that neither of us has a claim on each other's past, present or future earnings. So in case something happens and he loses his job before the court date, I won't be liable for any alimony. This is actually overall a very good deal for me and gives me a lot of security. In case anyone is wondering how we got this done so quickly, our state allows divorce on mutual consent grounds, which basically allows for a quick divorce without a legal separation period if the parties come to an agreement about all the finances and assets. Given that Amy is pregnant, my soon-to-be ex, let's call him Joe, yes, like the psychopath in the show You, was also very motivated to not drag this out. Now for the real dirt of this update. Last weekend, shortly after all our papers were signed, Amy reached out to me. She asked if we could meet and talk. Perhaps I should have declined, but I will admit I was curious about the 24-year-old prodigy and until recently a virgin person who was Joe's affair partner, so I agreed to meet her for lunch. So the first thing is, Amy is asterisk very asterisk pregnant, like the third trimester. She confirmed she is due in mid-October, which means the affair has been going on a whole lot longer than Joe let on. Whatever, it's water under the bridge as the divorce is almost final. However, after some polite but chilly pleasantries, she asked me, when am I going to be moving out of the house? Because surely Joe has been patient enough with giving me time to get my life together. And her apartment is small and they are needing space for the baby. Uh, what? I told her she must be mistaken as the house is mine, inherited from my grandmother, but asked her, what else has Joe told her about me, and our marriage? And, lie after lie, Joe's lies, that is, tumbled out of her mouth, along with crumbs of the real story. These gems include, well, it was true that she and Joe met at work. But it was about a year ago, when they were both interviewing for the executive training program they are now in. Amy said though, that they first became friends before getting together romantically. Apparently, Joe told her that he was legally married but that we had been separated in spirit and living separate lives since 2020 but he didn't want to kick me out and make me homeless during the pandemic because I didn't make much money and we live in a HCOL. Joe told Amy that we met in our early 20s when he was mentoring me in a GED prep program, that I was a high school dropout who was struggling with addiction, and essentially, that he rescued me. Helped me get clean, tutored me for my GED, and had been supporting me since gradually working on college classes. He told Amy I was working on prepping for an IT career and was currently making $45k as a help desk technician and that he wanted to make sure I could at least afford a studio apartment. He also told Amy that we had separated because I had relapsed and he couldn't have a meaningful relationship with a drug addict. Uh, all this is lies. My entire history of drug use is occasionally sharing a joint in college, maybe four, five times total, never anything harder. It is true that Amy was a 24-year-old virgin prodigy. She seemed dismayed that Joe had told me that though, at least the virgin part. Said it wasn't a moral issue, she really was just focused on school and work and didn't make time to date. And that generally guys her age seemed mostly interested in casual hookups, especially the younger finance bro types, and she wasn't interested in that, but that Joe took the time to get to know her and was actually interested in a meaningful relationship. I asked her if the pregnancy was, planned? She said no, of course not, but it was a miracle because Joe had a vasectomy, so they took that as a sign that they should keep the baby. Uh, no, Joe did not have a vasectomy. 
As we were planning to be a child-free couple I suggested it a couple times over the years, he firmly stated he didn't want to alter his body like that, so he left birth control as my responsibility. So dot 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 it really does seem that Amy is pretty blameless here. I mean, those of us who have been around the block would likely know not to believe a guy who claims to be separated but is still legally married and living with his wife, but, without her having any dating relationship experience I can see where she would have taken him at his word, about everything. After all, I didn't know anything was amiss with Joe until a couple months ago. And I was married to him. Of course Amy didn't want to believe me and I don't blame her for that either. After all, she's been in a relationship with Joe for close to a year and is 7 plus months pregnant with his baby, who is coming soon ready or not. I couldn't immediately refute everything she said, but showed her a couple things. First, a picture of me in my late teens with my grandmother in front of my house, and also, my LinkedIn profile, which shows my current job and education. Told her to do what she wanted with the info and to please stay safe and take care of herself, and then said my goodbyes. Yes, it was all very odd and unexpected and surreal. Sorry this is so long but figured those following my tale would be interested in this turn. I am not sure if I will update again. Maybe in a year or so when I have truly processed everything with lots of therapy and am hopefully on to living my best life. As for Joe and Amy, it's up to them to find whatever their path is. I do hope she wises up and leaves him but am sadly not confident about that. I'm sure he will be able to spin all this in his favor because that's what he does. But I also can't make it my problem anymore. Comments and OP's replies. When asked, how did she take it when you said you owned the house? OP replied, she didn't really believe me about the house and said she was going to have to talk to Joe about it. She said she hoped I would think about it and not be so stubborn and that the offer remains open to take the money she offered to move out by the end of September. When asked, maybe the reason he didn't have more fun money was that he was spending it on her. OP replied, oh yes, definitely. A lot of the golf days were actually spent with her, not golfing, and he only played golf once or twice a month, not weekly as he represented to me. Apparently he convinced her that the reason he could never spend the night with her, during most of the past year, before he moved in with her, was that I tended to get high in the evenings and he was always worried I would OD if he wasn't there to keep an eye on me. When asked, did you tell her he didn't really have a vasectomy? OP replied, I did tell her, but her answer to that was to insist that he did have one, he just didn't want to tell me. Because he had only gotten one because although he did want kids, he didn't want to bring them into the world with a drug addict spouse. Final update. Three months after the last update. Last time I updated, we had thankfully quickly agreed on a divorce settlement that allowed me to protect my most important assets, and I had just met with his mistress Amy at her request. At which time it was made clear that he had lied to her about numerous circumstances, such as that our home belonged to him, it did not, I inherited it from my grandmother, that I was an underemployed high school dropout drug addict. I'm not, I have a master's degree and a high-paying tech job. That we'd been separated in spirit for years. Also not true, I didn't know anything until he blurted out the news about his affair over the summer, and that he had a vasectomy, he did not, we talked about it but he decided not to despite us, him in particular, not wanting kids. I told her the truth and even provided as much evidence as I had on me, but she didn't seem to believe me and went home to Joe. I know quite a few people have been reaching out for more news, but I wanted to wait until my divorce was finalized to avoid risking any complications, and also just thought it best to let things settle for a bit. The good news is, I'm now divorced. The final decree came through a few weeks ago. It actually all went very smoothly. I'm eternally grateful to live in a mutual consent divorce state that allows divorcing couples to proceed quickly if they can come to an agreement on finances and property. On the Joe Amy front, after my last post, all was quiet for a couple weeks, until Amy, her due date quickly approaching, reached out asterisk again asterisk, to ask if I'd given any more thought to her offer to pay me $17k to vacate the house quickly so that she and Joe could move in. Again this is the house I inherited that I own free and clear, but Joe told her he owns it and that he was just giving me time to get my finances together before evicting me. At this point I decided to package up a lot more evidence of Joe's lies to send on to Amy. I sent her a copy of the deed and property tax record showing the house is in my name only. I sent her copies of my diplomas to prove I am not a high school dropout. I sent her some info on various professional associations I'm involved in and awards I have won to show I actually do have a senior level job and am not underemployed, as well as proof of my income. I sent her copies of all my drug test results for the past five years, I have a drug-free workplace and have to test two, three times a year, to show I am not an addict. I sent her time-stamped photos and text exchanges to show that Joe was still having a romantic relationship with me until July this year, nothing salacious. 
just photos of us showing G-rated affection, exchanging loving words over text. I even found a text exchange from a couple years ago when we last discussed him potentially getting a vasectomy, with his final decision not to proceed with one. A couple days later she responded, she believed me. However, in the end it didn't matter as Joe convinced her he had lied for very good reasons. The way they both tell the story, they met at work and were incredibly drawn to each other, in a way that felt inevitable. However, due to Joe being married, he felt that if Amy knew he was, to that point, happily married she would either turn away from him and miss out on the love of a lifetime, or she would go ahead with an affair but be consumed with guilt. So to avoid either of these outcomes, and especially to save Amy from guilt, Joe decided to create an alternative narrative in which he was in a marriage that had ended for all intents and purposes years ago, in all ways but legally, because I was an uneducated addict who kept relapsing and couldn't get my life together. That was she could essentially believe he was single. How noble of Joe, to bear all the guilt alone. Unfortunately, Amy said she understood and forgave him immediately. With a baby due any day, I suppose I can sort of understand the desire to justify the lies, even though the reality is horrifying. I suppose it's also not my problem anymore. Amy did have her baby over a month ago and I guess she and Joe will, make whatever life together or not, is meant to be. As for me, I'm doing very well. Actually got a big promotion at work, not managing people which I don't want to do but will be working on higher profile projects, with a 40% raise. Which starts after the new year. The house is really big for just me, so I have a couple roommates now. A friend who is also going through a divorce moved in, as well as a younger, mid-twenties cousin who moved to the city for work. We're all having a lot of fun together. I'm not really ready to date yet, still in therapy processing all the marital fallout, but getting there and looking forward to whatever new adventures life has to offer. This will probably be my last post, in this series anyway, as the saga of Joe and Amy, or at least my role in it, is finished. With us legally divorced and having no ongoing financial or other ties, the best thing I can do is leave them to their own story and get on with my Joe-free next phase. Thank you all for listening to my story for much of 2023. I do truly appreciate the support and helpful advice I received along the way. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you. After my dad died, my mom threw out all of his belongings to make room for her partner and forced me out, saying she didn't want filth from the past. My father died three weeks ago, following a protracted illness. He had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis a few years back. He fought valiantly, but he soon became unable to continue, and we lost him. It was a great emotional blow for me because I was much closer to my father than to my mother. I, 18M had no idea how to feel, and I was just starting to deal with my sadness when my mother decided to toss me out of the house so she could move in with her boyfriend. Within one week, I lost my father and discovered that my mother had been having an affair with a co-worker all along. I'm not sure if my father knew about it but it doesn't make a difference. I was outraged when she brought home her boyfriend just four days after my father died, and we had a heated argument after he left. She told me that this romance had been going on for a long time, basically since my father was diagnosed. She stated I had no idea how tough it was for her to have a sick partner, and so I had no right to blame her for finding love elsewhere. She also stated that she was aware that she would eventually lose her spouse, therefore she saw nothing wrong with what she was doing. I informed her that what she did was extremely pathetic. She told me I had to leave, so I paid for it the next day. She didn't want any filth from the past in her home anymore, and she wasn't just talking about me. She and her boyfriend had begun moving a lot of belongings from my father's room in the morning. By the time I awoke, there were crates in the front yard. My mother informed me that I could either take the boxes with me or burn them. Either way, they were all leaving her house. They gave me a few hours to gather my belongings and depart. I opted to spend my time packing my possessions rather than disputing with them. My mother's actions suggested she was too far gone, and I didn't want to sacrifice my dignity by speaking to her. We had pretty well stopped getting along a few months before my father died because she was constantly fighting with him. I didn't believe it was proper to dispute trivial matters and be so mean to him, especially because we knew he wasn't going to make it. After learning of the affair, I lost all respect for her, therefore I was relieved to be going. I made a few phone calls, and after a while, my girlfriend said she could speak with her parents and allow me to stay with them for a few weeks until I could get back on my feet and make other plans. I am quite appreciative of that. I've been living with them since my mother booted me out, and they've been quite nice, particularly my girlfriend. We've just been dating for three months, and she didn't need to do this, but I'm grateful to her. On the day I left, I grabbed the boxes that my mother had thrown away, 
which included my father's stuff, as well as my own. I figured I couldn't let them burn since that would mean losing the remainder of what my father left behind. This made my room really cramped due to all of the items, but it was worth it. For the past few days I'd avoided even glancing at those crates, let alone rummaging through them. The reason was simple, it reminded me too much of my father, and I was not prepared to confront it. I knew I'd end up bawling on the floor since I already missed him so much. So I'd been avoiding it like the plague. However, two days ago, I made the decision to go through some of the boxes, regardless of how difficult it was. I was extremely lucky because the first box I chose was full of documents and documentation from my father's room, from before he was taken to the hospital in his final weeks of life. He had been working from his room in the house because he was in no fit to go out every day. My father worked as a tax consultant for a large corporation, so there was a lot of paperwork involved. I didn't comprehend much of it, so I put it aside. I got to the bottom of the box and found a blue manila file with my name on it. That was it. What I discovered there is going to finish my mother and I'm here for it. Going through the contents of that folder, I learned that my father had really left a will, which my mother was presumably unaware of, or perhaps she did and was just not telling the lawyer. Not only did I uncover the will, but also several additional documents, including the house deed. It found out that the house did not belong to both of my parents, but rather to my father. After reading the will, I learned that my father had left the house and all of the money in his account to me. My mother had only received his car, which was still a huge deal because my father drove a lovely automobile, and she had taken ownership of their holiday property. I recognized my mother had no right to kick me out of the house because it did not belong to her, now or at any moment. It was originally my father's, and it is now mine. So far, my father's lawyer had informed me that his assets would be frozen until the court determined how they would be distributed. However, as soon as I discovered those documents, I called him and informed him of my findings. I invited him to my girlfriend's house and asked if I may move back into my own house, as my father's will clearly specify that the house belonged to me, not my mother. He affirmed that I was free to do so if I wanted, and that my mother had no authority to kick me out without appropriate notice. That was everything I needed to know. The lawyer would manage the will's execution, but I planned to address the problem with my mother. I called her right away and informed her I'd found my father's will. He had indicated that he would leave me the house and all of the money in his bank account. She remained silent for a few minutes before saying it didn't matter to her. But now that the tables had been turned, I asked her to leave the premises. The house never belonged to her, and she had done nothing to deserve it. She'd been nasty to my father and now she was being horrible to me. I informed her that I wanted her out by the end of the week. That's when she began groveling. To be honest, I anticipated her to argue with me because that is how she has always been, argumentative and unpleasant to everyone around her. Instead, she begged me not to say or do anything because she had convinced her partner to move in by promising to handle everything. Apparently, her co-worker was married but had recently filed for divorce, and his ex-wife was demanding a large sum of alimony, which was understandable given that he cheated. He was concerned about it, and my mother promised him that she would manage everything for him. This meant allowing him to live with her so he didn't have to worry about housing or rent and could concentrate on his divorce. If I approached them and stated that the house did not even belong to her, she would be screwed. So if I talked to her boyfriend, she would not only be homeless, but also alone. I'm not a cruel person, so I told my mother she could keep behaving as if she had the means to help her partner, but I didn't want her to live in my house anymore. I vowed not to say anything about what she had told me as long as she agreed to leave the house by the end of the week. I didn't care where she went, all I needed was for her to leave so I could return to my home. Then she started telling me it wasn't fair, it was blackmail, and I couldn't do this to her. I reminded her of how cruelly she had treated me just a few days before, so it was absurd that she wanted me to consider her circumstances now. I did not believe I was being unjust. After disagreeing with me for a while, she began crying on the phone, saying she couldn't believe I was treating her like this simply because she wanted to be happy in her life for once. She claimed she didn't want to marry my father, but she was already pregnant with me and her family had pushed her to. She claimed my father had never treated her properly, had always been preoccupied with his work, and had never made enough time for her. She was only trying to have a good life with her partner, and the only reason she kicked me out was because she knew I was like my father. I wouldn't stand in the way of her happiness. She stated that my actions were proving her point. I didn't know what to say at this point, so I told her she had one week and hung up. Since then, I've been feeling rather guilty. I'm not sure why but hearing her cry over the phone made me feel horrible. I'm not sure if this is because I'm doing anything wrong, or if it's simply because I'm a sensitive person who can't bear hearing people cry. I'm bewildered, so I'm here to ask, Aida, 
Why did you tell my mother and her boyfriend they had one week to vacate the house? Edit. I don't have any family in this state, so I had to rely on my friends for aid. I've spoken with my grandparents because I'll be attending college in a few months and will need their support to handle expenditures. After describing the issue to them, they severed relations with my mother. She's probably not worse off for it, because she never got along with her own parents and only had a cordial relationship with her in-laws. Regarding the will, I'm not sure why my father left the house and all of his money to me. Or why he hadn't discussed it with his lawyer. I did ask my father's lawyer about it and he revealed that he had been urging my father to prepare a will since he was diagnosed, but my father kept claiming he would do it later. Now, it appears that he left behind a holographic will because there were no witnesses or lawyers involved, which may make it simpler for my mother to fight it. We'll deal with it as it arises. Fortunately, in our state, even such wills are regarded as genuine, and I'm thinking my father was aware of this. As for why he left the most essential stuff to me, I'm guessing it's because he presumably drafted this document while at home, and my mother had been arguing with him over nothing in particular. She was only arguing with him because she could, and he couldn't just leave her, no matter how upset he was. I suppose that is why he took this decision, and to be honest, I believe it was a good one. To address your questions, I don't know my father's specific motives, but here is my theory. Update 1. Hello, I am still living with my partner, and after reading the comments, I have decided to rethink my decision. I will continue to insist that my mother leave the house, but I have chosen to modify the terms of my agreement. After I posted the last update, many of you urged that I consider the possibility that my mother will fight the will, which would cause me a lot of grief. I thought about it, and you were correct. I didn't think about it at first, so I called my mother back. I informed her that I was now willing to give her six months to locate a place and move out of the house. She looked astonished when I mentioned it because we hadn't spoken since our last conversation. She didn't have an explanation for her change of heart, but I did tell her that since I was giving her six months, she needed to swear not to fight my father's will. Hopefully, six months would be enough time to verify the legality of the will in court, and then we could begin dividing the assets. I suppose six months would also allow my mother's boyfriend enough time to finalize his divorce. Personally, I would have liked to generate a lot of hardship for my mother and ask her to leave within a week, making sure she felt as bad as I did. But hey, I need to. Right now, it's more vital for me not to act rashly because that will only lead to difficulties for me rather than her. She stated she would think about it before agreeing to anything, so we'll see what she says. Update 2. Hello. Three days ago I told my mother that if she promised not to fight the will I would let her stay in the house for another six months. I was leaving for college in three months anyhow, so I assumed I'd ask my grandparents to send me money so I could buy an apartment. I did not want to burden my fiancé by staying with her for so long, but her parents insisted that I do so. My girlfriend and I have only been together for three months, but we genuinely love each other, so she said the same thing. With my living arrangement fixed, I wasn't in a hurry to have my mother leave the house because it didn't make sense. I hoped my mother would agree to my demands so that I could have my father's lawyer sign off on them. If she signed a legal contract, she wouldn't be able to back out. I was expecting to hear from her with good news, but instead she called me today and asked if I expected her to sign any paperwork or contracts for our agreement. I instantly replied yes since I did not want to mislead her. And to be honest, I did not trust her. This was a given. She paused for a few seconds before telling me that she was not interested in signing a contract. That annoyed me because it implied that if she knew she had to stick to it or face the repercussions, she was hesitant to make any promises. I was upfront with her, telling her that if she wasn't willing to sign a legal agreement, my offer was off the table. I told her I didn't trust her at all, and she shouldn't be shocked considering her recent behavior towards me, which has been nothing short of nasty. I expected her to disagree, but she told me she agreed, though she also didn't trust me, insisting that I was unquestionably my father's kid. I had no idea what that had to do with anything because neither my father nor I had ever done anything that could be considered untrustworthy. The only thing she had against my father was that she had been forced to marry him because she became pregnant with me, and my grandparents decided it was best to proceed with the marriage. That is not my fault, nor is it my father's fault. If she didn't want to marry him, she should have stood up for her rights. Besides, I am not even sure how true her narrative is. I asked my grandparents about it, and they stated they hadn't really pressured her but they had only encouraged her not to raise me on her own because she was so young at the time, and my parents appeared to be in love. Both of my grandparents suggested they marry, but there was no pressure on them. The other issue my mother faced with my father was that he worked too much. I don't believe that's a major issue because, of course, he had to work. My mother didn't work for the first few years of their marriage and finally started working about seven years ago. 
She obtained the position since one of her friends and her friend's spouse founded the company. Otherwise, she would not have found the position she currently brags about. She claims to be an independent lady, but that is only because my father has always supported her. She had no right to say she didn't trust me because I'm my father's son. I was annoyed, so I told her she could do anything she wanted but because she refused to sign a contract, I wanted her out of the house. I hung up before she could say anything. She tried phoning me numerous times after that, but I was too annoyed to speak with her. She hasn't called in the last half hour, but I'm confident she will. I will only talk to her after I've calmed down. Update 3. My mother did not call me again following our last talk, as I described in my previous report. I waited for her to call for the next two days, but she just did today. I was nervous because I wasn't sure what to anticipate. To be honest, on the one hand, I genuinely wanted her to agree to the deal I proposed, in which I let her reside in the house for six months until she could make alternative arrangements, in exchange for her not contesting the will. I thought I was being fair, but after our last disagreement I wasn't sure she would agree. When she called today I tried to be kind and civil because this wasn't just about her. I also had something to lose. I was expecting positive news, but as soon as I picked up, she informed me that she had made her decision. She opted not to sign any contracts. Instead, she was determined to fight the will, and she had even consulted with a lawyer about it. I was taken aback because this obviously meant she would no longer be residing in the house, which belonged to me. I told her that if she contests the will, she will no longer be able to live in my house. I hoped that would bring her back to her senses, but she said I had no authority to kick her out because the will had not yet been ratified. She had a point, but she also had no authority to kick me out because we were in a bit of a gray area right now. I told her we'd probably have to live together until the probate was completed. That concept clearly made her uncomfortable, and after a few seconds, she informed me she'd look for a place to live, but she'd take her time because I had no right to tell her what she should do. I assured her again that she could take as much time as she wanted, but that I would be back by the end of the week. She began ranting, accusing me of being a bother and claiming she had done nothing to deserve the harassment I was subjecting her to. I almost laughed because her claim that I was bothering her was the biggest joke of the century. She kept attempting to rant but I hung up because we had nothing else to talk about. She'd made her decision and I didn't think I could change it anymore. I'm going to do what I believe is right and she can't stop me. Her partner, who is going through his own divorce, will not be much assistance to her either. I, on the other hand, have my family, girlfriend, and friends on my side. In fact, I believe I will tell her boyfriend the truth about my mother because I have been withholding information for far too long. Since she has made up her mind, I have decided to be an inconvenience, and there is no reason to keep this a secret any longer. Update 4. I did it. I informed my mother's lover the truth about the situation at the house. I don't think he had any notion until recently, which is strange considering he lived with my mother. This is a major deal to keep from your boyfriend, especially since she was still in contact with me, and I'm sure he would have asked about it. But I assume she's pretty adept at keeping secrets. After all, she hid her affair for a few years. It was not difficult to reach him. I just searched him up on Facebook and sent him a message containing proof. I also explained why I was telling him the truth now and not earlier, because I had been negotiating with my mother. But since she had made it apparent that she was not interested, I believed he had a right to know the truth. I sent the message two days ago and I finally heard from my mother today. I was expecting an eruption, but I didn't realize it would come so late. Anyway, she tried contacting me this morning, but I blocked her out of frustration. I've also blocked her on social media. When she ran out of other ways to contact me, she set up a fake email account and sent me a message from that address. In the email, she said that I should be pleased now because I had caused so much drama between her and her boyfriend for no reason. She claimed he had decided to leave her and return to his wife to attempt to work things out, blaming her for the entire situation, which, to be honest, he was correct about. I'm not really sure what she's furious about. The message was lengthy, and it contained warnings that she would make sure I paid a high price for this. All I could think was, she can bring it on. Truth be told, she no longer scares me. I've already lost all I could lose, and there's only one direction to go. Up. So, I'm looking forward to the court case. Update 5. Hello guys. I haven't kept you updated on what's been going on in my life over the last year and I believe it's time I did. As I previously stated, I was looking forward to the court process and my mother did end up fighting the will. The case got to court, and my father's attorney and I fought as hard as we could. Long story short, after eight months, we eventually received a favorable ruling. The will was validated and upheld. 
This happened two months ago, and I'm still really pleased with it. My mother had to give up the house, and we no longer communicate with her. I have no idea what she is up to, but I am delighted she received her karma. Even her own parents have stopped communicating with her, so I'm pretty sure she's not living a joyful life right now. My neighbors told me that on the day she moved out, her boyfriend came to help her. So I'm betting they're back together, because no self-respecting lady would return to a man who had cheated on her. I'm very sure his wife rejected him, so he crawled back to my mother to make things right, and she gratefully accepted him back. Honestly, I'm pleased they're together. They deserve each other. I'm confident my father is beaming down at me from heaven because I've demonstrated resilience, strength, and a willingness to stand up for what is right. I'm in college now, set to begin my second year. My grandparents are currently supporting me financially, and they will continue to do so until I find work, for which I'm glad. I know many of you are intrigued about my relationship. She also attends college, and we meet on weekends. In fact, we're arranging a little break for just the two of us this weekend. We are still going strong and are really serious about each other. Life is currently serene, and I am grateful to be at this point. Getting here was the most difficult part. After that, everything else felt easy. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real life stories happening around you. I allegedly received pictures of my wife naked. She denies it. The truth that I cannot believe is behind those pictures. I'm John. That day I'm sitting in my office at home, the glow from the computer screen barely lighting up the room. It's just another evening, or at least it was supposed to be. Lisa and I have been married for three years now. It's my second shot at this whole marriage thing, and I've been putting everything I have into it. We've had our good days and bad days, like any couple, but I've always believed that what we have is solid, built on mutual respect and understanding. As I glance at the clock I see it's just after 7 p.m. That's when an email notification catches my eye an anonymous sender, which is odd and unsettling. Curiosity mixed with a hint of dread compels me to open it. Attached are several pictures with a message that chills me to the bone. See for yourself what your wife does when you're not around. I hesitate for a moment but then click through. The pictures start loading, and I feel a cold sweat breaking out. They show a woman, engaged in sexual acts with different partners. The woman's face is cleverly obscured, no eyes, no complete facial features that would make her instantly recognizable. Just parts of her mouth, her nose, things like that. Despite the lack of full facial recognition, a sinking feeling in my gut tells me it's Lisa. I know her body, every curve, and every line, there's no mistaking the familiarity of the shapes and details in those images. But there's no absolute proof, just a terrifying possibility. I try to tell myself it can't be true. This has to be some sick joke or a mistake. But denial is a heavy blanket, suffocating and full of fear. I run my hands through my hair, trying to make sense of it all. My heart is racing, anger bubbling up, but there's also betrayal, slicing through me. I sit back, overwhelmed by emotions. How do I even begin to deal with this? The thought of confronting Lisa terrifies me as much as it compels me. What if it's true? What if it's not? I'm caught in a storm of doubt, and every possible outcome feels like it's going to tear my life apart. I shut down the computer. The screen goes dark, and I'm left in the quiet of my office, alone with my thoughts. It feels like the walls are closing in on me, each second heavier than the last. I need to talk to her, to confront this head on, but I'm scared of what I might find out. The rest of the night stretches out before me, long and uncertain. I reopened the email after a brief respite, steeling myself against the tumult of emotions it had already stirred. The images, still there waiting like uninvited guests, seemed even more imposing than before. As I began to click through them, my focus narrowed on the crafty ways each photo was manipulated to obscure the face of the woman they claimed was Lisa. In one image, the angle was such that her hair fell forward, curtaining most of her face except for her lips. Those lips, slightly parted in a familiar expression, sent a jolt through me. They resembled Lisa's, especially the way the upper lip peaked in a subtle bow, just like hers when she smiled. Another photo showed only the side profile from the nose down. Her nose, the slight bump on the bridge from an old high school soccer injury, was unmistakable. Or at least, it seemed so to me. Each photo was a puzzle, a sinister game of hide and seek. Eyes, the windows to the soul, and perhaps the most identifying feature, were always conveniently blocked, by a hand, a shadow, or the angle of the shot. It was clever. Too clever, and it felt personally tailored to inject doubt and paranoia into my thoughts. Turning my attention to the body in the photos, I tried to be as objective as possible, which proved almost impossible. I knew Lisa's body intimately, the mole on her right shoulder, 
the faint scar on her thigh from a childhood fall, the tattoo of a little star on her ankle, hidden unless you knew where to look. As I scanned the images, each of these marks checked out, aligning with what was represented before me. The turmoil in me grew as these recognitions piled up. The emotional roller coaster jerked me between denial and reluctant acceptance. How could someone so similar to Lisa exist? And why would someone go through the effort of staging these scenes with a lookalike? The logistics of such a deception seemed far-fetched, yet the alternative, that it was indeed Lisa, was devastating. My methodical comparison grew obsessive. I fetched old photos from our trips to the beach, paused videos to catch her in motion, matching moles, and scars with the woman in these unsettling images. Each match twisted the knife a bit deeper, each similarity a confirmation I wished to avoid. Sitting there, surrounded by these digital and physical fragments of my life with Lisa, the doubt was suffocating. My mind raced with scenarios, explanations, justifications. Could there have been a mistake? Could this be an elaborate hoax? Yet the personal details, the intimate tiny landmarks of her body, how could they be duplicated so precisely? I felt betrayed. Not just by the potential actions the photos suggested, but by the invasion of our private life, the exposure, and the scrutiny it forced upon us. It was as if our intimacy had been stolen, repurposed to play someone else's cruel game. The trust I had in Lisa, in our bond, felt undermined, slowly eroded by each click through the photos. I needed to confront her, to ask her, to hear her deny it with her own words. Yet, a part of me dreaded that confrontation. What if her denial couldn't extinguish the seeds of doubt these images had planted? The prospect of living in a constant state of suspicion was paralyzing. The emotional weight of the situation was overwhelming. Here I was, dragged into a nightmare scenario piecing together the reality of my marriage from digital shadows and hidden truths. My love for Lisa battled with the creeping dread that something fundamental in our relationship was amiss. As I sat there, alone with my thoughts and the glaring light of the screen, I felt a profound sense of isolation. The room seemed to close in around me, each breath heavier than the last, each thought darker than the one before. The tension was palpable as I sat at the kitchen table, waiting for Lisa to come home. I had decided that confronting her was the only way to move forward, whether to clear the air or confirm my fears. The printed photos lay in a neat stack beside me, their presence like a physical weight. Lisa walked in, cheerful and unsuspecting, her day evidently having gone well. She noticed my somber mood immediately and her smile faded as she approached. What's wrong? She asked, her voice tinged with concern. I took a deep breath, my hands trembling slightly as I slid the stack of photos across the table towards her. I need you to look at these, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Lisa looked puzzled but picked up the photos. As she flipped through them, her confusion turned to shock, and then to anger. What is this, she demanded, her eyes finally meeting mine, filled with hurt. These came to me today, anonymously. They're saying it's you in these pictures, I replied, struggling to maintain composure. Lisa's face hardened. And you believe them? You think I would do this? It's hard not to, I confessed, my voice cracking. I recognize things Lisa. Your mole, the scar on your leg. Are you kidding me? She interrupted, her voice rising. Do you know how many people have moles or scars? This is ridiculous John. But it's not just any mole or scar, it's where they are, how they look. It's all too specific, too familiar. Lisa threw the photos down and crossed her arms. I can't believe this. You think I'm capable of this just because of some photos that anyone could have manipulated. I don't even know these people. Her denial was adamant, her indignation clear. John, this isn't me. Someone is trying to mess with us, to ruin our marriage, can't you see that? How can you let some anonymous trash shake what we have? I felt torn, her words battling the mounting evidence before me. I want to believe you, I do. But I'm scared Lisa. I'm scared of what it means if it's true. And I'm scared too, she replied, her voice softening. Scared that you don't trust me that our marriage means so little to you that you'd think I could betray you like this. We stared at each other, the gap between us filled with doubt and pain. Look, she continued. I've been with you, here, every day. When would I even have the time to do... this? Her gesture to the photos was one of dismissal, of contempt for the accusation they represented. But how can someone fake this? It looks so real, so exact, I murmured. More to myself than to her. Photoshop John. Ever heard of it? Lisa was almost scoffing now. People can create anything they want with technology these days. Why is it so hard to believe that someone might want to hurt us? Her arguments made sense, and yet the doubt lingered. I don't know what to believe anymore. Lisa sighed, 
her anger receding somewhat as she saw my distress. I am telling you the truth. It's not me. I don't know how to prove it to you beyond telling you and trusting you'll believe me. I nodded, the conflict within me churning. I need some time, Lisa. I need to think. Fine, she said, her voice thick with emotion. Think about our marriage. Whether my words mean anything to you. She left the room then, leaving me alone with the photos and my swirling thoughts. The confrontation had not brought the clarity I had hoped for. Instead it deepened the chasm of uncertainty and mistrust between us. As I sat there looking again at the pictures, I realized that no matter what the truth was, the damage was already significant. Whether these images were real or falsified, the seed of doubt had been sown, and I wondered if it could ever be uprooted. After Lisa left the room, I remained seated, the silence of the house amplifying the turmoil within me. My heart raced as I picked up the photographs again, each image echoing back my deepest fears and insecurities. This wasn't just about the pictures, it was about trust. About my ability to discern reality in my own marriage. The thought of someone deliberately trying to sabotage our relationship was terrifying, yet the alternative, that Lisa could betray me so profoundly, was equally unbearable. The internal conflict gnawed at me. Doubt and suspicion clouded my judgment, making it difficult to separate rational thoughts from emotional reactions. Every moment I had spent with Lisa over the past years replayed in my mind, each memory now tainted with a shadow of doubt. Had there been signs I missed? Had her laughter been a little too forced, her excuses a little too convenient? Reflecting on my past relationships, particularly my first marriage, I recognized a pattern of mistrust and insecurity that had contributed to its downfall. I had promised myself not to carry these insecurities into another relationship, yet here I was, feeling the same old fears creeping in. It pained me to admit that perhaps I hadn't learned as much as I thought. The realization that my unresolved issues could be projecting false narratives onto Lisa was a bitter pill to swallow. I pondered the implications of both possibilities. If the photos were indeed of Lisa, the betrayal would cut deep. It would mean she had been living a double life, deceiving me while pretending to be committed to our marriage. How could I continue to live with someone who had shattered my trust so thoroughly? Could a relationship survive such deceit? On the other hand, if the photos were a fabrication, our marriage was being tested by an external threat. Would Lisa forgive my doubts and my accusations? Could she understand my fears, or would she see them as unforgivable? As I sat alone, the weight of the situation pressed heavily on me. My love for Lisa battled against the horrifying possibility of her infidelity. This struggle was not just about whether I could trust her, but whether I could trust my own judgment. Had my previous experiences clouded my perception to the point where I could no longer give her the benefit of the doubt? The house felt emptier than usual, the rooms echoing back my conflicted thoughts. I missed the comfort that Lisa's presence usually brought, yet her absence allowed me the space to think without influence. I needed to determine where these feelings were coming from. Was it simply fear, or were there legitimate reasons for my suspicions? I decided to approach the problem logically. I listed facts and evidence on one side, emotions and feelings on the other. The facts were thin, anonymous photos, no concrete proof, just coincidences in appearance. The emotions however, were thick with fear, insecurity, and remnants of past hurts. It was clear that my emotional response might be clouding my ability to see the situation clearly. The more I thought about it, the more I realized how crucial it was to communicate openly with Lisa. If we were to overcome this, whether as a victim of a cruel hoax or as a couple facing infidelity, we needed to face it together. Hiding my feelings or allowing my insecurities to dictate my actions would only lead to further damage. I also considered the broader implications of either scenario on our future. If Lisa was innocent, we would need to strengthen our trust and possibly seek help to deal with the trauma of this attack on our marriage. We might even need to investigate who would want to harm us this way and why. If she wasn't innocent, then I would have to make some tough decisions about my own future, and what I could forgive. Sleep was elusive that night. The bed felt colder the shadows in the room longer. My mind raced with scenarios, each more painful than the last. The early morning hours brought no relief, only a deepening sense of unease. By dawn, I had reached a decision. I would confront the situation head-on, seeking clarity and truth, regardless of the outcome. I owed it to both Lisa and myself to resolve this doubt once and for all, to reclaim the trust that was the foundation of our relationship, or to accept its collapse under the weight of truths too heavy to bear. As the first light of morning filtered through the curtains, I prepared myself to face whatever the day might bring. My heart was heavy, but my resolve was firm. No matter what happened, I needed to find peace and move forward, either with Lisa by my side or on a new path alone. As the investigation into the anonymous photographs unfolded, the emotional stakes were incredibly high. 
I grappled with my doubts and my commitment to uncover the truth, while Mark, the digital forensics expert, meticulously dissected the images. Each discovery he made amplified the tension. The superimposed details, the artificial blending of shadows. The digital breadcrumbs he uncovered did not just hint at manipulation, they screamed of a deliberate malicious intent to deceive. When the source of the email was finally traced back to an old friend of Lisa's, someone whom I had met and trusted, the betrayal felt like a physical blow. This was a person who had sat at our dinner table, laughed with us, and all the while harbored intentions to dismantle our happiness. Confronting him was a dramatic showdown. We met in a quiet corner of a local cafe, the air thick with tension. His initial denial added to the suspense, his face a mask of feigned ignorance. But as I laid out the evidence, his facade crumbled. The admission when it came, was not just a simple confession. It was a torrent of pent-up jealousy and frustration. I loved her first, he blurted, his voice cracking with emotion. You were never right for her. I thought once you were out of the picture, she'd see that. His words were like daggers, but they paled in comparison to the pain of his betrayal. The confrontation left me reeling, not just from what was said, but from the raw palpable desperation in his voice. Returning home to Lisa, I was a mix of emotions. The relief of having discovered the truth was tangled with sorrow for the ordeal I had put her through. Our conversation that evening was one of the most intense we had ever had. I recounted every detail, from the digital inconsistencies to the painful confession of her old friend. Lisa listened, her face a canvas of changing emotions, shock, sadness, and finally, relief. I never doubted you, not really, she said, her hand reaching across to squeeze mine, a physical reconnect that spoke volumes of her trust and forgiveness. But knowing how far you went to clear this up, that means everything. Each day felt like walking on a tightrope, balancing between normalcy and the undercurrent of doubt and suspicion that the anonymous photos had introduced into our lives. During the day we tried to keep to our usual routines. Lisa went to work, and I handled my business from home. But the evenings, once a time for relaxation and togetherness, had subtly shifted. We still sat down for dinner together, still talked about our day, but the conversations often felt strained, punctuated by pauses that seemed to carry more weight than the words themselves. I noticed small changes in Lisa's behavior. She was quieter than usual, her smiles didn't reach her eyes as they used to, and she seemed to retreat into herself more often. It wasn't overt. Anyone who didn't know her as well as I did might not have noticed anything at all. But to me, these were loud alarms over the silent sound of our growing distance. Trying to bridge this gap, I made efforts to engage her in activities we both enjoyed, watching our favorite TV shows, going for walks in the park, trying out new recipes together. Sometimes, these moments felt like old times, and a sense of hope would bubble up within me. But more often, they served as stark reminders of the ease and comfort that seemed just out of reach. As nights turned into weeks, the uncertainty began to weave itself into the fabric of our daily lives. Each loving gesture, each shared laugh, was shadowed by the unspoken questions that lingered between us. Was this real, or just a facade? Could we truly get back to where we once were, or had something irrevocably shifted? The ongoing uncertainty was exhausting both emotionally and mentally. There were days I felt optimistic, buoyed by moments of closeness or a particularly good day spent together. But there were also nights I lay awake, staring at the ceiling, wondering if the foundation we built our relationship on was strong enough to withstand this storm. In these moments of solitude, I realized how much of life is out of our control, how circumstances can change with startling rapidity, and how the known can become unknown in the blink of an eye. Yet it also underscored the importance of what remained constant, the effort, the choice to strive for understanding and to cling to the fragments of normalcy that could still be salvaged. As Lisa and I committed to moving forward together, choosing trust over suspicion, we sought the guidance of a couple's therapist. This decision marked the beginning of a new chapter in our relationship. One that required facing our vulnerabilities and insecurities head on. Our first therapy session was tentative, as we both navigated the unfamiliar territory of discussing our deepest fears with a stranger. The therapist, Dr. Helen, provided a safe space her office a sanctuary where words that often went unspoken could finally be aired. We discussed the impact of the photos, and I shared my feelings of betrayal, not just by the anonymous sender but also by my own doubts about Lisa. Lisa spoke candidly about her sense of violation and the hurt caused by my suspicions. It felt as though our years together, our moments of intimacy, weren't enough to keep your trust in me, she said, her voice steady but tinged with sadness. Dr. Helen encouraged us to explore these feelings further, pushing us to understand not just the immediate reactions to the photos but also the deeper, underlying issues in our relationship. Trust isn't just built on faith, she explained. It's also built on the foundation of understanding each other's fears and vulnerabilities.
Over several sessions we delved into our pasts, my previous marriage that had instilled a deep-seated fear of being deceived again, and Lisa's experience with being unjustly accused in her professional life, which made her fiercely protective of her integrity. Understanding these aspects of each other helped us see how quickly we could trigger each other's insecurities without meaning to. As we progressed in therapy, our homework was to practice transparency and vulnerability. We scheduled regular check-ins at home, where we shared anything that weighed on us, no matter how small it seemed. These moments were awkward at first, laden with hesitations, but gradually they became our truth sessions, filled with raw and honest exchanges. Therapy sessions were interspersed with activities designed to rebuild our emotional connection. We revisited places that held special memories for both of us, like the park where we had picnicked on our first date, and the beach where we celebrated our first anniversary. Each visit was an opportunity to discuss not just the past but our dreams for the future, slowly weaving new threads into the tapestry of our marriage. Dr. Helen suggested we write letters to each other, not texts or emails, but old-fashioned pen and paper letters. Writing allowed us to express thoughts and feelings that were too difficult to say out loud. Reading Lisa's letters, I saw the depth of her love and her pain, her commitment to us, and her fears about losing what we had. My responses echoed my resolve to move past my doubts, to affirm my trust in her, and my gratitude for her strength and patience. Halfway through the year, we decided to renew our vows. It was a simple ceremony, just us and a few close friends and family in the same little chapel where we had married. Standing before Lisa, repeating my commitment to her, felt profoundly different this time. It was a promise not just of love, but of faith in our growth and understanding as a couple. As we continued therapy, we learned to embrace not just the easy love of good days, but also the challenging love of bad days. We recognized that while the scars of this ordeal might never completely fade, they were testament to our resilience and commitment to each other. Through it all, Lisa and I learned to navigate this new reality, finding solace in our resilience, and in the understanding that while uncertainty might be a part of our lives for now, it didn't have to define our relationship. We were more than this crisis, and with time, perhaps we could rebuild what seemed threatened, finding new depths of trust and commitment amidst the turmoil. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real life stories happening around you. After discovering my husband's autism and kitty food preference, I faced deceit and marital stress, leading to my decision to divorce. Well, it's been a lot longer than the one week update I promised. I could make excuses but I won't. For those of you who don't want to read my original post, I asked for help with my husband's food preference issues and through talking with many people on here and, ultimately, his mother, it was revealed that he was diagnosed with autism as a child. Some of the comments on my original post were, not so kind. I got a lot of accusations that still hurt me. Some just make me angry, particularly the person who commented simply, please don't bully him. He's my goddamn husband. Not a schoolyard friend, not a sibling, not a child. Infantilizing him doesn't help his case at all. Moving on. I was very upset as he had never mentioned anything to me. We've discussed all sorts of medical issues together but his diagnosis never came up. I want to stress this. This isn't a matter of me not wanting to be married to an autistic man. This is a matter of my husband keeping something important from me and causing me a great deal of stress that could have been avoided if I was aware of his diagnosis. For example, I continuously pushed him to try new foods or attend concerts or visit loud amusement parks. I knew he wasn't particularly thrilled about any of those things but they are all very normal couple activities that I wanted us to experience together. Had I been aware of his autism I would have had a better understanding of how negatively these things affected him. And made more of an effort to integrate things he liked with things I liked, maybe a smaller local band, or a craft fair instead of an amusement park. Anyways. That's the backstory. Read below for the update. Update. I confronted him about my conversation with his mother the night before our counseling appointment. I made sure to bring it up casually so I didn't become angry again. He tried to brush me off at first, saying he didn't know what I was talking about. After talking for a bit he eventually confessed that he not only knew of the diagnosis but deliberately kept it from me. He said I was his dream and he didn't want to do anything to ruin our perfect relationship. I explained how him keeping this from me hurt me. I explained how I could have been there to support him instead of feeling like he needed to hide. He said he wasn't ashamed of it at all. He explained that it's just not something that affects him anymore. I, again, explained how it affects me, but he didn't seem to care. I didn't show him the post I made but I used some of the advice from you all to try to explain why his autism really does in fact still affect his life. We went to bed upset. The next day he acted like nothing happened. We ate breakfast, he had chicken nuggets, and went about our day. I kept expecting him to bring it up but he never did. 
I didn't have the nerve to bring it up again until later at the marriage counselor's office. I spoke to the counselor so as not to seem accusing and explained that this was an issue that bothered me. My husband actually laughed and said he assumed I'd gotten over it by now. When I explained that no, I really hadn't, he got angry with me and stormed out. The counselor tried to mediate but it wasn't much use as my husband went to wait in the car. I was worried he'd leave without me so I cut the meeting short. Our ride home was quiet. It wasn't until we got home that I said I was worried he was keeping other things from me too. He said he'd been reading online about how women can't understand autism and therefore he didn't think it was important to tell me about it. I said that was the weakest excuse I'd ever heard. He then said that I'd leave him if I knew. I said if I left him it'd be because he's a liar. Apparently he told all of our mutual friends that he'd just been diagnosed with autism and I was considering leaving him because of it. Now many of our friends won't talk to me and act very cold when we run into each other in public. I don't know what else he's told them but I think he told someone I cheated on him as a fake account has been commenting horrible things about me and my supposed sexual habits on all of my Instagram posts. I keep reporting them but then it seems like another just pops up in its place. I haven't decided if divorce is the right path. I know he's been browsing incel and other bitter male-centric websites, one of his friends is a self-described incel, so I'm even more convinced that this isn't the man I married. I'm mostly just confused. I've been avoiding him at home and it feels like more of a roommate situation at this point. He doesn't really leave his den until it's time for work, and then he's back in the den until bed. It seems like everything is messed up, just from me wanting to help. I don't even know what to expect at this point, much less how to move on from here. Edit, there are so many more comments than I anticipated. I'm trying to at least read through most of them although I think I'm past my emotional ability to reply. I'm really shocked at how overwhelmingly supportive people are. Thank you. I'm going to be discussing divorce with a lawyer. I don't know how to bring it up with him but I'm past the point of caring. You're all right. I dread coming home to him in the evenings, I dread if he will miraculously want to talk. This isn't healthy for either of us. At the very least some time apart would be good. That's all for now. I don't think I'll update past this as I'm already uncomfortable with how quickly this blew up. But I will be living elsewhere by the end of the month. Now to the next story, story 2. My wife will not shut up and I'm not sure I can take it that much longer. Is it possible for that to be a reason to leave? I'm not sure if I should have posted this on AI to instead. But here goes, my wife will not shut up. I'm not talking about your usual chatty Kathy. I mean she, almost literally will not. Shut, up, she will talk continuously from the moment she knows I am within earshot. Not just in the same room. I mean as soon as it's reasonable to assume that I can hear her. She will not stop talking until I'm gone, and sometimes not even then. On more than one occasion, I've gone into the bathroom, turned on the loud exhaust fan, taken a leisurely dump and then returned to hear her cheerfully engaged in the same conversation, she was enjoying before I went in. She also refuses to use the exhaust fan while she's in the restroom because it would prevent her from being heard. So I get to hear all the bathroom noises on top of whatever Homeric epic about her friend's cousin's girlfriend's hairdresser she's blathering on about. I once drove from Tampa, Florida to Chicago, Illinois with her, before we were married, I'm such an idiot. Without saying more than 10 sentences. She did not stop talking the entire way. The entire way. Television onto a show I like? Pfft, that's not a problem. She'll happily turn the volume down so it doesn't get in the way. Having sex? That's the perfect time to tell me about how Olivia Newton-John still has the leather pants she wore in Greece and she, brace yourself, still fits in them, really. Needless to say, we don't go to the movies. Ever. I've been shushed out of too many theaters. I get it. She grew up in a huge Italian Catholic family in the Bronx. If you don't talk loud and constantly, you don't get to talk at all. I, on the other hand, grew up in a Scandinavian family with two children. To this day, I'm not sure we ever had a conversation in our house. I actually often wonder if that's what made me attractive to her. I was taught to politely listen to people and then wait for them to finish before replying. She never finishes, or takes a breath it sometimes seems. So to her I'm paying rapt attention to her no matter how much she talks. That's not true though. Another difference between people of Swedish heritage is that we don't use filler words for acknowledgement. Other than the Minnesota na, useful on every occasion, we're pretty much silent when we listen to others. No uh-huh, or yeah, or omg, needed. A nod of the head every 10 minutes or so is all you need to convey your attentiveness. I think it has a lot to with living in the frigid north. You keep your mouth open as much as my wife does, and your teeth are going to shatter from the cold. To her, that's like being in the room with a dead person. 
she's always stopping to ask are you even listening? Or say, you never pay attention to me. Or even quiz me with, what did I just say? I've become an expert at storing the last two to four words she says and parroting them back at her. She'll be like, blah blah blah. And then she told him she wasn't taking that kind of crap anymore. And I'll go that kind of crap. As if I had any idea what kind of crap it was or who it was that wouldn't take it anymore. And she'll say yeah, and think I've been paying attention the whole time. I joke about it a lot, but it's actually getting to the point where it's a problem. Our son is 7 years old, and he has developed a pronounced stutter because she interrupts him constantly. Growing up in her house, if anyone paused even for a millisecond, that was grounds for talking over them. And you talked loud so they didn't finish. My son apparently inherited some of my less staccato speech patterns, and she basically just uses that to interrupt and take over the conversation. It got so bad that he started automatically stopping and restarting words, even when not being interrupted. I didn't know that was considered a stutter until we went to one of those parent-teacher night things, and a teacher listened to wife and then turned to me and said, well at least now I know why Josh has a stutter. Just like that. She's failed at least one job interview because of this. I know because I lined it up with a business acquaintance myself. He called me up and said sorry, but he just couldn't take being in the same room with her because she wouldn't stop talking. We rarely are invited for a second couple's date. She monopolizes the conversation every time we go out with other people. Who wants more than one does of that? You're probably wondering, well, have you told her about this? Yes. Many times. Sometimes jokingly. Sometimes with utter seriousness. The reactions vary from anger, talks louder, higher, faster, and uses lots more swear words, to tears, she's the only person I know who can carry on a totally unrelated conversation while sobbing hysterically. The one thing that doesn't happen is her talking any less. I try not to let it get to me. She's a very affectionate woman. Loves me to death. Mother of my child. Pretty as the day we met, prettier even. We still get plenty of alone time. Granted, she won't shut up while we're doing it, but I'm pretty busy so I don't really notice as much. But it does get to me. It's selfish and shows a lack of self-awareness. There's a time and a place for enthusiastic conversation, and they're not always and everywhere. I know the answer to the problem, I have to talk back. In effect, the only thing that possibly could shut her up is for me to do the same thing as she does. I would have to interrupt at the slightest pause. I would have to talk louder, yelling if necessary, when she tries to interrupt me. I would have to learn to use Italian hand gestures to emphasize my points and chop off her objections. But I'm not Italian. I'm a waspy pale dude who grew up in a household that would have made a mortuary sound like a middle school cafeteria. Twelve years of this has finally pushed me to the brink. I'm not sure I can take it that much longer. I'm just not sure if I could get a word in to tell the judge why I'm there in his divorce court. My wife wouldn't let me. TL.DR. Wife will not shut up. Is that reasonable grounds for leaving her? Edit, obligatory Reddit, OMG I had no idea this would blow up. Which is true, I thought maybe a couple of people would just call me an asshole and that would be it. But RIP, inbox. It was nice to know ya. So in the interest of not replying to every comment, I will try to address some of the common ones and answer some of the questions I saw popping up multiple times. Also thanks for the, often hilarious, advice. Q1, is this BS? Implied. A1, no, it's all mostly true. I admit to some embellishment for dramatic comedic effect though. The bit about the leather pants is representative, not an actual quote. Not from sexy times anyway. She probably mentioned it at some point though. Q2, why didn't you run away screaming before you got married? Sub-question, was OP's wife hot? A2, yes, she is hot, and funny, and vivacious. Also, I really was a Nordic silent bear, thanks, you slash Sarah underscore Dragonfire, my wife drew me out of my shell. And if I'm brutally honest with myself, when you're young and getting laid on the regular, a lot of things don't seem all that terrible. Damn you penis, this is all your fault. Q3, did your kid really develop a stutter because of this? A 3. Medically speaking, I cannot state this with 100% certainty. The cause was never formally diagnosed. However, I watched it happen firsthand. I'm not a qualified speech therapist, but I think it was a reasonable conclusion to draw based on the observations I made. I'd welcome a dissenting opinion from an actual professional though, if only to salve my conscience. Which leads to, Q4. Aren't you really the one responsible for your kid's stutter? After all, you did nothing to stop it. A 4, guilty. And I feel utterly like shit about it all the time. 
For the record I did bring it up lots of times even to the point of getting into arguments about it and speaking harshly to my wife when she interrupted my son. But I think by the time I realized it was happening most of the damage was done. And anything I could do was more expressing my anger about it than actually making an effective change. All the rest of this weirdly long post is just ranting. If there's an actual justification for leaving, this is it, and I'm deathly afraid that she'll get full custody and just make it worse or even irreparable. Q5. Is it because she's, pick one, OCD, insecure, autistic, mentally ill? A5. I don't think so, although I've always sensed an overwhelming need for attention. I see it in her family dynamic, in that all of her many siblings were in constant competition for their parents' attention and affection. Q6. Have you tried counseling? A6. No, probably should have, but I know her well enough that even mentioning it would shatter her. It's bizarre that I can't bring myself to do a lot of things people have suggested, and believe me, I've probably thought of all of them, because they just seem too cruel to me. And yet, I'm seriously considering divorce. I realize the contradiction there. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you.